about you? I'm are good. We, are we live or is this kind of what, what's the nature of the uh, broadcast here? Yeah, you're live right now. I mean, so what I do there, there's about 30,000 people on my newsletter list. So I give everyone the chance to watch live if they want. Uh, but then I send out the recording afterwards. So this is technically live. Looks like we have about 76 people on right now, uh, but I'll upload it to my YouTube channel and then blast it out to the 30,000 people in the next hour or two. Great. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Sure thing, man. So I, I so I did a write-up on App Harvest a couple of weeks ago. So I've, I've been in the stock personally and then also a social capital fund that I run. I'm obviously a big fan of what you guys are doing. I think vertical, indoor vertical farming is the future of our food supply. So uh, most of the people that are watching live right now have probably read that write-up. So they probably know a little bit about the company, but some of the other 30,000 people probably haven't read it or the people on Twitter. So why don't you kind of just give us a, a rundown of what App Harvest is doing? Yeah, well, Jonah, thanks uh, and appreciate the, the opportunity to, to discuss our work. So. Uh, at App Harvest, we, we've set out to build uh, some of the world's largest controlled environment agriculture facilities. Uh, you can see over my shoulder uh, our first facility in, in Moorhead, Kentucky, uh, nearly 2.8 million square feet uh, in growing space. So, you know, the way to kind of think through this, Jonah, is uh, we've described CEA, controlled environment ag, is really the third wave of sustainable infrastructure. Uh, 20 years ago, it was renewable energy. Uh, 10 years ago, it was electric vehicles and automotive. And then right now, it's controlled environment agriculture. And it's using technology and infrastructure you know, to redefine how we grow. Um, but in our system, we, we, can, we can grow a fruit and vegetable with 90% less water, uh, get 30 times more yield per acre, uh, and get the harsh chemical pesticides out of the growing practice uh, and use a non-GMO seed. Uh, and then for us at App Harvest, you know, th there's going to be a lot of players out there and in a lot of different ways. And, you know, it's the same way of, of kind of looking at, at a car and going, well, that's that's a race car. And, and, you know, there's a race car from the 1950s, you know, that's a combustible engine. And then, you know, there, there's a race car in 2021, you know, that's all electric. And so, you know, the same way we would say, you know, one facility, uh, they're, they're, they're not all similar. Uh, necessarily. Um, it, it really depends on what the technology going in is. Uh, and so what we're doing here at App Harvest is using proven technologies, you know, combining those together, being at the cutting edge. Uh, and then, then some of the differentiation between us and others is, is where we're doing it. Uh, we're in central Appalachia where we can get to 70% of the U.S. in a one-day drive. Uh, Amazon is building the largest prime facility in the world right now in northern Kentucky. Wow. Uh, almost a $2 billion prime facility. Uh, UPS has their global air hub in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, and then the coal industry really thrived in Eastern Kentucky and West Virginia because they could get the resource to the Northeast, Midwest and Southeast in a day drive. Uh, so happy to kind of drill down on any, any pieces of those, Jonah, as you see fit and kind of talk in more detail where, where you'd like to focus. Sure thing, I appreciate that. So the, definitely the number that stood out to me in the very beginning when I first heard about App Harvest was the 30 times yield. Um, so talk to us about how you're able to do that. I mean, we can start with the fact that you guys don't have to deal with the weather elements and you can grow 365 days a year, right? And you can, you use a special diffused glass ceiling to optimize the, you know, kind of the growing environment, the humidity, the sunlight, all of that, right? Special lights. Yeah, so Jonah, one way to look at this again is, a. a we don't like to use the word greenhouse because it, it's a big bucket. You can go to Mexico and you can find a plastic hoop house with a dirt floor and they'll be selling that as, as a greenhouse fruit and vegetable. You know, we again, I, I like to make the car comparison of like a 1950 sports car versus a 2021 Bugatti. It's we we have the latest and greatest technologies to be able to control the environment inside of our facility. You know, 30X. Uh, it is, is fairly conservative compared to, you know, where the technologies are going and where the opportunity is in, in the future. Um, but how do we get there? We get there a couple of ways. One is we, the, the same way the fruit and vegetable, the tomato plant, tomatoes are first crop, the same way the tomato is living, it's a plant, our facility is living. We're controlling that environment 
to give the plant exactly what it needs uh, all day, every day. So it's perfect conditions, right? You're building perfect, the perfect conditions. Bingo. So LED lights that, that add micromole light that the sunlight's not providing. You know, we're putting water directly to the root. So how do we get, how do we use 90% less water by, by precision of getting water directly to the root? We're adding the exact amount of nutrient the plant wants, uh, fluctuating humidity uh, and temperature controls inside to give that tomato plant or uh, veg fruit and vegetable plant exactly what it wants. Uh, and, and you also collect rainwater, right? And that way rainwater runs off into a retention pond and then you use UV light to essentially what purify it before it gets recycled back into the irrigation system. Yeah, so not only do we use 90% less water, so let's talk about water for a little while and then we can drill down on some other pieces. 95% of a fruit and vegetable is water. Uh, I was just talking to some wine growers yesterday in, in uh, California. In 2017 and in 2020, uh, Napa Valley wine growers had to, had to throw out much of their crop uh, because of wildfires and the fire in the dust that, or the, the ash that ended up getting on the crop. We're in a water rich region, central Appalachia. So we, five of our last 20 to 25 years have been the wettest years on state record. So we are getting wetter while other parts of the US are drying up, the Southwest of the US and California. We're collecting that rainwater on our roof and, and storing it. And, and you can see in the top corner here, uh, the retention pond, Almost, and, and Jonah, once the vaccines are out and you feel comfortable, we'd love to host you and some of your listeners to come check out our work. Uh, the retention ponds, uh, 75 Olympic sized swimming pools. So we collect all that rainwater on our roof. We put it in, in our retention pond. We only filter it with sand and UV. And then that goes back into the facility. Uh, this is important for a couple of reasons. If we were to use city water, or well water or water from the ground in, in our facility, that would have sodium. Rainwater has no sodium. As a result, we're able, once the water goes in our facility, it only leaves as a fruit and vegetable. Uh, if, if we had sodium running through our system, you would have to flush it to get the sodium out. And that's where the agricultural runoff comes from. Okay. So, not only do we use 90% less water because of the way in which we get the water directly to the root of the plant, we run completely on recycled rainwater, uh, which means we can just circulate that water, not have any sodium buildup, and we have no agricultural runoff. The, the way in which we've designed the water system, it, it's pretty simple in theory. Uh, the size is what's making it complex. Uh, and to, to our understanding, you know, it, it's the only facility we're aware of that runs completely on recycled rainwater. Uh, and that's because we're in a water rich region where we can collect all that rainwater and, and, and continue to run our operations on it. So this 2.8 million square foot facility behind you is gonna be exclusively for tomatoes, correct? Yeah, and that's pretty simple. We, we've, we, we've got a lot of smart people on here on the team, but we try to be simple at the end of the day. And why did we pick tomatoes? Uh, it's the number one import from Mexico. Four billion pounds of tomatoes were imported from Mexico to the U.S. last year. That was almost 1.2 billion pounds uh, 10 to 15 years ago. How is it imported? Through trucks, airplanes? How do they typically import vegetables from other countries? Well, if it's coming from Mexico to the U.S., it's a semi-truck, so an 18-wheeler. And that's, that's sitting for a week or two weeks. And in the middle of COVID, you know, you can read about the stories of, of 18 wheelers sitting at the border waiting to get from Mexico into the U.S. It's, um, you know, Joan, we talk about sustainability. We talk about resiliency. It, it's unacceptable that we're the largest economy in the world and the U.S. is shipping fruits and vegetables two to three thousand miles to get to consumers. And then we're flying in. I mean, I, you know, we, we're digging deeper into this. I mean, we're flying in our berries from, you know, countries in South America. We're flying in peppers, in some cases, from Europe. I mean, it's... Such it's, a waste of transportation costs. A wildly inefficient system uh, that will collapse over time. It's not even a question of if, it's a matter of when. And is it five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years? 
you know, we're, we're head down playing the super long game uh, here, here at App Harvest. Uh, and, and if you just look at the macro trends, you look at, you know, water scarcity in areas of the world where we're currently growing our food, California in the Southwest of the U.S., you know, water issues, you know, look at the, look at the breweries down in Mexico and, and the tensions they've had with local communities because they're taking water that's not available and they're using it. So water issues down in Mexico where we grow our food, and then we're trucking it two and 3,000 miles to a consumer. It, it's just fundamentally going to fall right on it, right, right, right there in the, right on top of itself. And that's where here at App Harvest, we're just head down focused on, on building the assets we need to build. So the other two facilities that you're building in Kentucky, what vegetables are going to go in there? Um, so one of them, we're, we'll be growing uh, leafy greens, uh, a whole host of different variety of leafy greens. Uh, the other facility, we're going to double down and continue to focus on tomatoes. Okay. Uh, and then we'll, hopefully this year uh, into next year, it's, it's a part of that 12 year pl- or the 12 project plan we put out. Right. So nothing new here, but you know, we're going to be growing all different v- variety of vine crops, tomato, cucumber, pepper, leafy greens, herbs, uh, and berries. We're, we're really excited to get into berries. Uh, there, there's a huge opportunity to, to reshape the way American consumers uh, are, are eating berries. If, if you're in Washington, D.C., and you go buy a strawberry, it, it's very likely that your strawberry is set on a truck for 10 days. Uh, and, and, it, and within a day or two, it's it's moldy and you're having to throw half the... Oh, absolutely. Away. So, I've, I've played that game before. You sit there and you go through, you pick up all the packages of berries and try to find the one that that's the least spoiled already. And that's why, because they're they're flying it from halfway around the world. Right. Um, after Kentucky, you guys go to New York and you start building facilities up in New York, correct? Um, for, for right now, we're head down on Central Appalachia. We... we you look at the Netherlands, and I continue to anyone that really wants to figure out what's going on in the industry, get on a one-way flight and go to Holland and roam around the south of the, the south of Holland, the southern part of the Netherlands. The, the whole country of the Netherlands could fit into eastern Kentucky in landmass, and they had the second most agricultural exports in the world, only behind the U.S. Wow. Uh, it's absolutely phenomenal what the country has been able to do. Uh, the robust, resilient food system they've been able to develop. We're taking that similar model of focusing our cluster of facilities uh, in eastern Kentucky and up into West Virginia. Um, And if you look at a map and you look at the southeast of Kentucky, southeastern Kentucky, and you go to the tip of West Virginia, that allows us to really, our distribution, we can get to all of the Southeast, Midwest, and Northeastern New York and Boston in a day drive. We, we think there's a lot of value in being able to cluster these facilities close together, uh, not only for construction uh, while we're building the facilities, uh, but operations so that we right. can share knowledge amongst these facilities. Uh, and that's going to be our U.S. hub that's really right. going to feed, feed the U.S. And then you know, when, when we decide to go outside of the U.S., that, that's, a, that's, a t- that's a discussion for another time. Now, before you started App Harvest, you were building huge solar projects, right? Yeah. Is yeah. there any, any solar component to App Harvest? I mean, I know your, your roofs are obviously collecting rainwater. Does that make it hard to do solar with the collection of rainwater? Uh, no. So, so we, my background in large-scale solar projects is what really set me up to, to help with this team here. Uh, on large scale controlled ag projects. So my background in energy of just building large sustainable projects is, is what you know I was able to bring to this company. Um, the, the last project I was a part of was 750 acres of solar uh, down in Georgia uh, as part of a, uh, an initiative to build on army lands. That just large build out, large infrastructure build out. Uh, it's those skill sets that we're going to need in, in agriculture that we don't really have right now, which is agriculture's moving to a technology infrastructure model uh, where we can use far less land, far less water, and get the harsh chemicals out of the growing practice. So the, 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 the experience from solar to this is really just the experience of building large. Uh, and then 
yes, it, it's helpful with our team to have that lens of resiliency. We, we don't really even use the word sustainability nearly as much as we do resiliency. You know, sustainability, it's, it's gotten a, you know, it, it's a word depending on which political circle you're in. It can be, it can be polarizing. Everyone can talk about resiliency. You know, we need resilient energy systems for the decades ahead. We need resilient food systems for the decades ahead. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're holistically looking at the design of our facility, not just how we grow that fruit and vegetable, but what are the inputs? Uh, so obviously energy, we're an energy consumer uh, and where is that energy coming from? And we're working with our local utilities uh, on, on the energy aspect of the company. But, you know, again, the way I started this, Jonah, is our, our thesis on this industry is again, it's the third wave of sustainable infrastructure. You know, 20 years ago, renewable energy was a boutique industry that very small and fringe in the US. And in the last 20 years, we've seen billions of dollars flood into every state rebuilding and, and putting solar and wind into portfolios. 10 years ago, it was electric vehicles. Virtually no one was talking about electric vehicles and automotive at scale. And now you have every major automotive company aggressively moving into electric vehicles. And right now it's controlled environment agriculture. The technologies are there to a point and I don't see anyone as competition. And, and we get this question and get it brought up a lot. I, I mean, my take is, is, is Tesla a better company today because every automotive company is pushing into EV and all these other 10, 12 companies are going public in EV. Like to me, that's a healthy thing for the automotive industry. And if anyone's delusional enough to think there's gonna be one company that moves the world in automotive, that's just lunacy. There's gonna be a lot of companies. There's gonna be a lot of energy companies that are gonna reshape the way in which we produce energy. And there will be a lot of agriculture companies globally. You know, We wanna stay out front and, and we wanna build big and large, but I frankly look at the anyone in this industry that's trying to do it right, use less land, use less water, use technology, get the harsh chemicals out, pay a living wage. To me, that's a colleague. And if someone's doing it right, you know, I wanna meet with them and figure out you know, wh where the opportunity is. But, but to me in, in this industry, we're so early in the reshaping of agriculture. It's less about competition and it's more about just best idea wins and, and let's, get, you know, let's get solutions to market. Uh, and over the next 10 years, we'll, we'll certainly see a lot of companies you know, double down and get pretty aggressive in this space. Who are you guys mostly selling to? Is it grocery stores? Is it restaurants? Uh, you know, casual fast food or um, quick service, I think, as they call it. So who's who's your your ideal customer or right now? Who's your primary customer? So grocery uh, and then we'll be at some of the major fast food chains uh, within the coming months. But um, right now, uh, Kroger, one of the largest grocers, Publix. Um, Walmart uh, and a couple others. So we're we're focused up trying to trying to get a good clean supply to the large American grocers. And if you if you're a grocer right now, think about this: if 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 I'm the CEO of a grocery and my fruit and vegetables are um, are, are coming uh, two thousand miles on a truck. 40% of fresh fruit and vegetables in the U.S. end up in a landfill. So oh. food waste for, for fruit and vegetable is atrocious. That's brutal. Uh, the EPA cannot track what's going on south of the border. So we have laws in the U.S., but it's very difficult to, to track what's coming out of Mexico into our food supply here. So if I'm, if I'm a grocer, I'm dealing with food safety, health issues, you look at the lettuce recalls that continue to happen. I'm dealing with spoilage. I'm dealing with trucking 2,000 miles that you're not sure whether or not it's going to get to your store in time. And then you've got the whole issue of where it's being grown in Mexico. And you know, our grower team, can there's gag laws in the U.S. where media cannot go on farms. So depending on what state you're in, there's gag laws in the U.S. where it's very hard for media to get onto farms. In Mexico. It's nearly impossible, Jonah. You know, you get a team and go roam around with cameras on farms down in Mexico. Yeah, Let me not shot. Turn, <laughs> that ain't even turn out to. And you know, it, it's unacceptable. Where that 
that is where our food is coming from. And we've got children making $5 a day who have no health care, who are using illegal chemical pesticides that it's impossible for the EPA to track. And it, it, it's got to radically change. And, and consumers are demanding different regulators are, are digging in. Uh, and, and there's an opportunity for, for grocers to really lead and go, we're going to set a five-year standard that if you get on American store shelves, every, every employee on that farm is making a living wage. They have full health care. You're taking care of your employees. You're not using harsh chemicals. If we can do it at App Harvest, you know, and we're this new company that, that frankly, this is not easy, Jonah. It's not, it's not code. We're not just developing code and soft and in software in San Francisco that regenerates itself. This is hard work. Uh, but if we can do it, I, you know, we're challenging the rest of the agriculture industry to raise your standards. Well, and you those- guys have, because I mean, you guys are a certified B Corp. Uh, and I believe there's only three or four other public companies that can say that. Uh, I know one is a company called Lemonade that I follow as well. But when did you guys make the decision to go to go that route? Day one. I, you know, we're a public benefit corporation. So we're filed as a, as a public benefit corp and we're a B Corp. So we're both. We have the certification and it's the way we're structured. We fundamentally, and I've been very fortunate with our early investors and our board, uh, we believe that the companies that are going to add tremendous value to society 10, 20 years from now are going to be those companies solving societal problems at their core and stop with the quarterly earning, you know, CEO mindset and start with the hard work of building a generational company 10, 20, 30 years out. Part of that is if you do not treat your workforce with dignity and respect, then nothing else matters. So, you know, we took a fundamental approach day one that everyone we hire is going to have full health care. Their families are going to have health care. I can't have employees worried about whether or not their son or daughter, you know, can go to the doctor. I, I need I need my employees every day thinking, how do I get the maximum yield? How do we get the maximum production? And to give people a living wage with health care, the ROI on that investment, I mean, it, it has been phenomenal. And I, I, I do think we're a test case because I, I spoke at conferences before COVID a year, two years ago, where people went, well, people don't want to work in agriculture. And I said, no, they don't want to work for you in agriculture because of the way you treat them and what you pay them. They do want to work here for App Harvest. We've had nearly eight or 9,000 people apply to work at our company. Uh, we have nearly 400 people on the team right now. Uh, and we think our most valuable resource is our team, investing in our team. The mission part of it, what we're, what we're working to solve for grow a lot more food with a lot less resources, align with the planet, align with nature. That's an outcome of what we're doing, you know, but it starts with our people and, and, and we are a public benefit corp, we are a B Corp, but, but to us, it's much more than just, you know, a logo on a, on a deck. Uh, it's something that we deeply ingrained into the company. And I've been very fortunate that our, our investors uh, have bought into, to, into the overall concept with us. So I have a few friends that live in Kentucky. One of them's actually been uh, to your facility and they've taken a tour and he's friends with some people that work at App Harvest. And he sent me a Facebook post that one of the employees did and they are, the employees do love you. Uh, I mean, I won't read the entire post, but it says, uh, honestly, it's the best place I've ever worked. Free uh, full health benefits, including dental and vision for you and your family, free life and short-term disability. They pay you two days a year to do fundraising 15 days off a year, not including holidays. They give all employees shares in the company. Um, it just feels like this is a great place. The whole place has a great vibe. Uh, I have yet to ever meet a disgruntled employee. The CEO is the real deal. He stands outside and greets the team every morning or stops you during the day to shake your hand and thank you for hard work. So that's that's so, impressive. And go to our shareholders who question what we're doing on that. The ROI on that investment we had an ice storm a couple of weeks ago. We had employees driving a tractor to work and they were dragging people out on the side of the road in their tractor. And, and that commitment to our mission, you know, yes, we're, we're spending a little bit more than what you would, you would definitely weigh more than what's happening in Mexico. And that, that's right. my frustration too. My competition in Mexico, the flip side of this is we've got children making $5 a day down in Mexico 
and that's our competition. But right, right. the investment we've made in our employees, and I've had to go to bat from day one on this with 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 everyone and our boards bought on. It is phenomenal, Jonah. And I really hope that it's a model in agriculture that I hope people copy what we're doing. If I wake up and I read about, you know, another farm that's taking the similar approach and getting, you know, great outcomes on their farm, you know, I don't see that as a bad thing. The, the reality of what keeps me up at night the most is the stark reality that you know, we need 50 to 70 percent more food by 2050. I mean, that's what the UN is outlined. We need 50 to 70% more food by 2050. And they've said we would need almost two planet Earths to grow that food the way we're currently growing it. If you watch the Kiss the Ground documentary on Netflix, you know, the UN has also said we have 60 years left of fertile topsoil. Wow. So I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky was coal country. People think of extractive industries and they think of oil and gas and they think of coal. Farming is another extractive industry. We're taking nutrients out of the ground. It, it, we're taking water from aquifers and we're not replenishing the nutrients in the soil. And we're not replenishing those aquifers. This farming has become another extractive industry that has a crash course, not 200 years from now, not 300 years from now, but we, we are using and abusing our soils to a point to where they're not fertile and we need to produce a lot more food. So to me, Jonah, the reason why we invest in our workforce is we need warriors on the, on the ground who are committed to this mission, who are gonna over the next 10, 20 years, find the challenges in front of us and fight through them and, and not let any obstacle stand in our way. And, and, and it's great to hear about the, the post that you know, your friend here in Kentucky that you know, saw somebody's post and, and that's, it, it's real. I mean, we're up at 5 a.m. in the facility you know, elbow tapping everyone as they come in. And, and that to me, John, I, and the exciting thing is these conversations, our employees are watching this. You know, they're, we're in an area of the country where there's not a lot of positive stories that come out of Central Appalachia. And we have a team that is on a war path uh, that will not take any obstacle or any challenge and look at it as something we can't break through. So uh, appreciate you highlighting our work. Two questions left. Uh, one, if someone does go into a Kroger, Walmart, how do they know that those tomatoes are from App Harvest? You can look for the sticker and our little logos on the sticker. Okay. Uh, Mar Martha Stewart, who's on our board, will be back in Kentucky with me on Monday. Uh, we're thinking through a more holistic kind of way to, to brand the company. I mean, at the end of the day, we want those hills, those App Harvest hills, to be the Nike swoosh or the Apple logo. I mean, right. at the end of the day, you've got to look for those hills. And that story has been told far before you ever go buy the product. And you know what we stand for and, and we align with people and playing it. So for right now, it's a little difficult. You got to look, but look for the hills. Uh, okay. And over time, we, we, we hope to make it more, more prevalent in, in the grocery store in the years to come. So last question. So kind of the two things that stood out when I was doing all my due diligence, one was the 30x yield, you know, crop yield per acre. The yep. second was when you guys are, you know, building out these, uh, you know, crops, in, in this case, tomato, you actually bring in beehives, right? And you use the bees to naturally pollinate the, the, the crops or the vines. So <laughs> how does that, I mean, <laughs> it just, I thought it was fascinating that you bring in, I mean, it was a couple hundred beehives, right? I mean, it was a lot. We're cycling bees in and, and yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's phenomenal to see technology meet nature and, and we've got to be very, you know, I, my, my viewpoint on this is the real technology in front of all of us is what's in nature. I mean, we look at an iPhone, we think this is technology, you know, it's not, it's pretty simplistic and basic really. What a bee does we cannot replicate what a bumblebee does. Right, right. It is the best way to pollinate a plant. And the, so the way we're able to do that is we don't, we, ha, we do not use the harsh chemical pesticides. Right, and so, that's why the bee population has been decreasing rapidly because of all the pesticides that are being used in open field farming. It's, it's atrocious, Joan. It's, it's absolutely, we're at a tipping point in agriculture. And, and I, I have a great respect for American farmers. I have a great respect you know, for those working every day to put food on our table, it is, it is our job to arm those farmers with technologies 
so that we can realign with the planet. Our, our facility, the way we've tried to, to coin this, we put nature first and technology supports from behind. So we're capturing the sunlight. We're only adding micromole light from the LED that the sun doesn't already provide. We're using all rainwater, uh, not using chemicals to filter that, just using sand and UV. Uh, we're using bumblebees to pollinate. We're not using the harsh chemical pesticides, which then allow us to use integrated pest management, good pests to kill the bad pests. Over time, we're layering in technology that is gonna support nature from behind. You know, but I think it's very important that right now we've, we've taken a bit of a scorched earth approach in agriculture where we, it's been us pushing from the top on how we want to produce our food. And we have to flip that. We have to allow nature to do what it does best, which is if you let the tomato grant plant grow in a perfect environment, it's going to flourish. It's going to grow really tall and fruit, a lot of fruit. Right. And our your, your tomato added, plants are growing, what, 15, 20, 25 feet off the ground? 45 feet in total, and we keep wow. riding them, and they're more harvesting uh, those tomatoes as they grow. So again, Jonah, you know, big picture, long term, you know, I hope people see App Harvest as a company that puts nature first. Uh, we use technology to drive nature from behind, uh, and, and we have a lot of work to do, but you know, over the next decades, we, we, we've got our sights on being one of the largest food and agriculture companies in the world. And, and, and we certainly have a long way to go to redefine our food system. We're playing a small part today and, and hope to be a really big piece in, in the decades to come. Well, I appreciate the work you guys are doing. I'm sure others do as well. Um, thank you so much for coming on today. Really appreciate it. I'll let you get back to your construction. I know you guys have two more facilities going up in Kentucky, so you probably got your hands full. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and Jonah, I'm happy to jump on here again. Uh, we, we're, we're trying our, I'm, I'm staying head down and really focused on our work, but I think it's important that we get out and message, you know, not only on, on some TV networks, but with discussions like this. So I'm happy to come back on, but you could hear the construction in the background. Uh, we're, 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 tr we're trying our hard to, to, to speed up construction as best as possible. So uh, thank you for having me and, and happy to jump back on anytime. Thanks, Jonathan. Appreciate it. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye.